Hello, my name is Gary. And I'm Dottie. And we want to tell you about our exciting trip to Tanzania. We departed Baltimore on January 29th, 2015 from Dulles Airport via Amsterdam and arrived into the Kilimanjaro Airport in Arusha, Tanzania at 10.30 p.m. on January the 30th. There were 12 of us in the group, and the trip was arranged through Accent on Travel. In Arusha, we stayed at the Lake Duluti Hotel. Each room was basically a little bungalow, overlooking a lake in the back. All of the bungalows were scattered throughout a lovely garden. The next morning, we all headed out towards a market. Along the way, we spotted our first wildlife, a marabou stork. As you can see, the day was really cloudy as we were walking to the market. But if you look very closely, you can see the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro. It's the best view we ever got. The marketplace was quite extensive. It had many varieties of fruits and vegetables and also a large area selling clothing. We had to be very careful taking pictures of people because they may chase you down and ask for money. This barren classroom is part of the local school system. This is where 860 students attend this school. The black on the wall is not a blackboard. It's just a part of the wall painted black. This system at the school is called Save the Rain. The rainy season runs from March to May and the month of October. The rain is collected and is siphoned off into the cistern and is used during the dry season. While walking through the school grounds, we spotted these couple of children who were with their father. They were very interested in us. We also learned some phrases in Swahili. Jambo means hello, Karibu means you're welcome, and Asante means thank you. Asante sana means thank you very much. The population of Arusha is one million. The total country of Tanzania has a population of 44 million. Now, as we're riding down the road, we happen to see this supermarket with a couple cows passing across in front. In the afternoon, we stopped at a cultural center. It's quite a place. Here we show a tray of rings using Tanzanite stones. Tanzanite is mined only in Tanzania, is rarer than diamonds, and was first brought to the U.S. by Tiffany and Company. At the hotel, we had five additional people join our talc group. Here we are meeting to go over some of the itinerary with our talc rep, Chris. The red line drawn on this map of Tanzania shows our route. From Arusha, we headed to the west to Terangiri National Park, followed by a visit to Ngorogoro Crater, and then the Serengeti National Park. From there, we flew to the island of Zanzibar off the coast in the Indian Ocean. We left Arusha on a Sunday. On our way out of town, we passed some ladies that were dressed in their Sunday best going to church. Tanzania is a diversified religious country. There are 40% Catholic, 40% Muslim, and 20% other. Dada dada. Dada dada. That was our guide Andrew speaking. He was explaining that the Dala Dala are these minibus taxis that are individually owned, driven too fast, and are totally unsafe. But they came into being because of the uh, poor transportation infra infrastructure supplied by the country. 
As we left this urban area for the countryside, we were driving into the Great Rift Valley area, part of the caldera of an ancient volcano. Well, here's a traffic stopper for you. Notice how young these kids are that are out herding these cattle to the next grazing place. We saw many young boys who were dressed in black with white paint on their faces. These young boys have many scars and puncture wounds on their chest. This is to prepare them for the pain of circumcision. This usually occurs when the boys are 13 to 16 years of age. The boys are not allowed to cry or to show any pain during the procedure. Those boys we just saw were driving their herd of cattle to or from a watering hole. This watering hole is a very large one and has many herds from different families. As we traveled across the countryside, we saw many different types of herds. Here are some goats. Right after entering Terengiri National Park, we spotted this little group of ostriches, our first animal sighting in the park. Our first game drive in the park was really exciting. Here is a black-headed heron. This is a lilac-breasted roller putting on a show for us. As you can hear, our guides were very well informed and told us about all the birds and animals that we saw along the way. This is the baobab tree. It's called the upside down tree. Legend has it that the tree asked God several times to change its appearance. God became angry and pulled the tree out by its roots and put it back into the ground upside down. Water wells are not common in the countryside, so families have to either hand carry their water or, in the case of this family, they have a donkey they can use to carry the water. Here's a warthog family doing what warthogs do. Are you looking at me? The blue flag that you see here under this tree is put there to attract tsetse flies. Here's a red-billed hornbill. This is our dining room at the Terangiri Tented Camp, where we all ate buffet style. We had a wonderful view of the valley from our tented camp. Here's a couple of giraffes and maybe an impala. Just to the right of the giraffes is this river, now being crossed by a herd of elephants. Here's the path from the dining room in our lounge towards all the tents. These are pretty nice tents. Inside there's a king bed, a full bathroom, and a shower. Once you're in your tent at night, you can't come out in the dark without an escort from one of the personnel at the hotel. The next morning's game drive began with the sighting of a black-backed jackal. Here is a male water buck feeding. If they are chased, they can emit the smell of a skunk. He's now being joined by his bride. Swimming along in a little pond, we come across a knob-billed duck. This hole in the baobab tree is used by poachers. Even though it's against the law, poaching is still done. The demand for ivory and rhino horn has so increased in China over the last seven to ten years 
This has happened as the middle class continues to grow. This little cutie in the top of a tree is a black headed weaver. Here is the woven nest of the weaver made out of dried grass. Here is a family of Egyptian geese. Here comes daddy to show them to the water. Here are two different kinds of bee eater. The white fronted in the top of the tree and the swallow tailed on the left. Our guides were very excited about this next sighting. Coming toward us on the right is a rarely seen oryx. Here we see a yellow-necked spur fowl, also known as a Franklin. My favorite animal and my favorite picture of the trip, this lovely giraffe. We stayed still for a long time watching the giraffes in their natural habitat. The birds on this giraffe's neck are called oxpeckers. They help keep the animals free from parasites. This giraffe is munching off of the thorny acacia. Notice the uh, thorns coming out. On the far shore, you will see the Nile Monitor Lizard. Just like people, an elephant is either right or left tusk. As you can see, the one tusk is shorter than the other, therefore his dominant side. This small little creature is called a dick dick, and they are a large food supply for many animals. Here's an impala and her baby. Note the markings on the back of the mother in the shape of an M. Our guide told us that this is to let the lions know that they have reached the McDonald's of the Plains. This is a white-headed buffalo weaver. Here is a tawny eagle panting in the heat of the day.
In the background is the Tarangiri River, which runs through the entire park. This is a white-bellied bustard. Look at this colorful little bird. It's a yellow collared lovebird. Along the way, we spotted many small trees that had been downed by elephants. Back at camp, we got our three guides together, Andrew, Sebastian, and Gustav, left to right. On our last night in Tangiri National Park, we were treated to the sight of a full moon. This is a mongoose family. They're sticking their heads out of an abandoned termite mound. The next morning, we were able to visit a Maasai camp. The men greeted us with dancing. The women, though not the main show, also greeted us with dancing. All of the tribe members were wearing these homemade shoes manufactured from used motorcycle tires. The Maasai are located in the northern safari area. The population is about 60,000. The wealth of the Maasai is found in their cows, goats, and sheep. The Maasai of today are getting away from a lot of their customs. Many of them now have cell phones and cars. The, the Maasai men are well known for their ability to jump during their dancing. The Maasai man can have many wives. It seems to prove their management skills in taking care of many people. The male also carries a stick which represents God saying that the cow was made only for him. As we head back into the camp, note the baby on the back of this mother. The Maasai drink the milk and blood from cows. This is their main source of nutrition. These branches are from the wait a minute tree. They have long thorns shaped like fish hooks. They're used as fences to keep the livestock in and predators out. The Maasai huts are constructed by women and can take two to three weeks to complete. They can last as long as five or six years. They're made of sticks, wood, mud, and straw grass. As we are getting ready to leave the Maasai village, I took this shot of this Maasai woman. I just cannot imagine this life. Now have a look at some of the Maasai dancing. So watch, watch the jumpers because we're, we're going to have a dance when we get to Ngorongoro. So tell me who you think gets more rides. These guys are so much way they're coming and going.
way to Ngorogoro Crater, we saw a rice field being planted. In one of the villages along the way, we spotted a Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama shop. Further down the street, there was a George Bush shop. The typical downtown of a third world country. A homestead along the way. This afternoon, we stopped at the Tumaini Junior School. This school was started by a game driver named Bayo. He started the school to teach English to the African children. It was started with seven children in 2004 in his home. Today, there are 760 students ranging from kindergarten to seventh grade. They have a 95% graduate rate of those going on to secondary school. Here's Gary surrounded by children. They just love slapping hands with everyone. They were very well behaved and spoke wonderful English. The school had a pretty good sized campus with plenty of room for the kids to play. And the school was a lot better than the school we saw in Arusha. Tauk, our tour provider, helped sponsor the school. They named the library after Tauk. This is one of the classrooms. Note that there are Christians and Muslims in the same class. We had a chance to walk around and talk with the children and look at their lesson plans. What they were studying that day was penmanship and they were tracing English letters in their workbooks and they were doing a wonderful job. <laughs> After visiting the school, we went on to the Ngorogoro Conservation Area. While we waited for the guards to check the group in, we were able to visit their little museum. It was quite nice and explained what we might see in the crater. Back in our safari vehicles, we were warned to keep our windows closed, as there were many baboons in the area, and they would go into vehicles looking for food if they found an opening. After checking in, we proceeded on to our hotel, the Serena Hotel, which is overlooking the Ngorogoro Crater. Here we see the sunrise from our patio the next morning. There's a lot to see inside the crater, and we were there for one full day. Our first sighting was of this superb starling. We ended up seeing a lot of these birds inside the crater. Our first sighting of a Grant's gazelle. Here is a steppe eagle high on the branches of an acacia tree, waiting to swoop down on his prey. Our first look at many species around a water hole. Now take a look at this short video. In addition to this zebra, Note all of the animals in the background. Here's a couple of young males practicing their fighting skills. Note the hyena walking through the middle of the herd. In the foreground are a number of wildebeest and their uh, newly born young. Here's the hyena looking after the herd hoping to find a weak one.
But notice the big male wildebeest on the right. He's keeping guard. It's a standoff. And here's a number of young hyenas. Our safari vehicles were modified Land Rovers that allowed the top to pop up. Everyone had a window seat when sitting down, but could stand up and see the whole countryside. One of Africa's big five game animals, the Cape Buffalo, is shown here taking a mid-afternoon siesta. This is the gray-crowned crane. It's the national bird of Uganda. Now watch some video. We came upon this small pond packed with hippos. Do you know what all this group of hippos is called? It's called a raft of hippos because they all bunch up together next to each other and form what could be considered a raft. This many large animals packed into such a small space can produce an interesting scent. That Egyptian goose off to the right better watch out. This is a Cory Bustard, the heaviest flying bird in all of Tanzania. Notice how the majestic horns on this old Cape Buffalo are all worn down from fighting to keep the herd. Our guide told us that the most dangerous Cape Buffaloes are those that are the older males that are either in very small groups or solitary because they'll tend to attack anything. Just like domesticated cattle, look at these contented buffalo. A couple things to note about this picture. Notice the zebra with his head resting on the back of the other. We saw this quite often, and the guides told us that this is because the zebra's head is so heavy. This gives them a rest. Also note on the right side, there's a warthog on his knees eating grass. We were told that we were going to have lunch in the bush. Not knowing what to expect, we were totally surprised when we rounded a corner and found tables set up with linens and linen napkins and nice chairs. It was amazing. As you can see here, there is a monkey sitting up there watching the festivities.
We marveled at this old boy with the big tusks. There are no large herds of elephants inside the crater, but there are some old male elephants. They're very large. Again, our buddy, the old warthog with the big tusks. Here are two of the big five in the same shot. The white rhino, which is very endangered, and the lion. Let's take a look and see how this came to be. On the road out of the crater, we came across this sleeping lion. Notice the full belly, so he had to sleep it off. There's one road in and one road out of the crater. There are many switchbacks and they are both very steep. This is part of our hotel overlooking the crater. As you can see, it's environmentally friendly. It blends right in with the countryside. As evening sets in, this is the view we had from our room overlooking the crater. As we leave our hotel the next morning, we're faced with another roadblock, a herd heading out for feeding for the day. Camels in Tanzania? We understand they were brought in only for tourists. We spotted this interesting lizard on our way to the Old Duvai Gorge. This area is very rich in discoveries. Two million years ago, this area was a huge lake. There was a volcano. The lake dried up. Faults broke apart. 
rains washed away layer after layer of ash and exposed many fossils and bones. Discovered in the volcanic ash area are these footprints estimated to be 3.6 million years old. This is called the Hominid Trackway of Latoli. The original has been reburied for its protection. Also in this area, the famous anthropologist Mary Leakey discovered a 325 million year old Lucy. This discovery of Lucy changed the thought process concerning early man. She was named Lucy because the crew was playing the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, at her discovery. Now here's an interesting comparison. There's a volcanic ash footprint from 3.6 million years ago and man's footprint on the moon. Well, who are these people? They're standing in front of the entranceway to the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. The Serengeti is an area that encompasses 10,000 square miles. Our first sighting in the park is this secretary bird walking alongside of a Thompson's gazelle. The secretary bird is a non-flying bird, eats snakes and lizards. Because of the dryness this year, the wildebeest migration has, was put off by about a week. The wildebeest can hold off giving birth for as long as three weeks while waiting for better food and water. We did have a chance to see some of the migration. Here it is along the horizon, wildebeest as far as the eye can see. We are standing on top of a rocky hill that is emerging from the plain. It's called Nabi in Maasai. This rocky hill is floating on a sea of grass called Serengeti Plains. These endless plains you see, Serenget in Maasai, derive the name of this most famous national park, the Serengeti. The migration route and a nursery for a new generation of wildebeest every year usually in February and March. There's not a lot of activity in the Serengeti during the dry season, which is June through October. However, in the rainy season, usually November to May, as many as two million wildebeest, zebra, and Thompson's gazelles migrate to this area. This colorful lizard was on top of the hill overlooking the plains. These are hartebeest, named after the shape of their horns. Always a spectacular sight as we stop the Land Rover and just stand and watch this herd of elephants. Our guides were telling us that there is no such thing as an elephant graveyard. As the elephant ages, its teeth wear out, and the elephant searches for softer grass. Now, while eating all of this soft grass and they're elderly, they die in large numbers, hence giving the name the elephant graveyard. Here are a couple of lappet-faced vultures looking for the next opportunity. Here you have to look very closely in the center of the picture. There is a rock python slithering along this tree branch. 
I'll leave this up here just a little bit longer so you can try to find the Python. Here's an interesting sight. Right on top of this rock, there's a pride of lions sleeping. Oh boy, what an exciting day. We get to see a cheetah. The next morning, we headed out again on the Serengeti to see what we could see. One of our first sightings was this old giraffe. Note the bumps on his head. This was our mode of transportation and a lot of what the roads look like over there. Now, you just can't go to Africa without making a study of the trees. This is a flat-topped acacia tree. We couldn't decide which set of giraffe we liked best, so we put both pictures in. Finally, a sighting of a leopard, the fifth of the big five in Africa. This leopard is usually nocturnal, so it's difficult to see during the day. 
They're strong enough to be able to carry an entire antelope up into a tree and feed on it for several days. The Serengeti National Park has a very nice visitor center located in the middle. At the visitor center to greet us was this little chubby rock hyrix. Here is a weaver feeding its young in the nest built into an acacia tree. It's well protected with the thorns. This is a vitiline masked weaver. When we got back to the hotel that evening, we had appetizers and drinks on the patio overlooking the plains. As it was getting dark, Rick and Gary got to use the infrared cameras. These were used to spot game even in the midst of trees where you couldn't see them, and it works at night. Ah. Sunset over the Serengeti. The next morning we were up at 4 a.m. We then took an hour's ride on very rough roads. We went out to take a sunrise hot air balloon ride over the Serengeti. Here we are getting ready for liftoff. It's going to be a video. <laughs> hey! 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 What a beautiful experience. We saw a few animals. We saw giraffe, impala, hyena, fox, and gazelle, but many were too small for pictures. These are very large balloons. Each gondola can carry 16 people plus the pilot. After about a one hour ride on the balloon, we came in for a landing. Now you talk about a small world. This is our pilot, Sean. And we discovered that Sean was also our pilot when we were in Jaipur, India. All over the world, it's a tradition upon landing in a hot air balloon to have a champagne toast. So we had one right on the spot. Another tradition is to have a breakfast but they didn't want to put it together here. So we got back in our vehicles and headed towards the breakfast. Along the way, there was an amazing sighting. Very unusual to see a leopard walking alongside the road in broad daylight. We arrived for a first-class breakfast under an acacia tree. Oh no! Another champagne toast! Then, just before breakfast was served, out of the mud of a river comes a hippo. He circled the camp and the guards were ever vigilant. This could have been a dangerous situation.
Having been up since 4 a.m., the English breakfast was very yummy. After breakfast, we each got a certificate for our balloon flight. Then we were off on another game drive. Here is a topi. What a stunning picture. Do you know what they call a group of giraffe? No, what do they call a group of giraffes? A tower. Oh, that makes sense. Here's another tower of giraffes. Here's a young buck impala away from the herd. Here's another tower of giraffe. But the reason I like this picture is if you'll look to the right towards the back of the picture, you'll see two giraffes that are laying down in the grass. All you can see are their necks. Here's a large Nile crocodile in a river. We kept this picture of the hyena because it's not all muddy and dirty like the other ones we had seen earlier. This is a whistling acacia. The thorns protect the pods, which are full of ants. An early sign of migration occurs when the zebra come. They eat the tall grass so that the shorter grass is available for the wildebeest and their babies. A group of zebra are called a dazzle. This is the inside of our tent at the Kirawira tented camp. The only thing that makes this a tent are the canvas sides. This is the view from our veranda at the front of our tent. The entire Serengeti plain out in front of us. There were no fences whatsoever around this camp, so they had roving guards day and night that would help protect us from the wild beasts. Speaking of wild beasts, here's a silhouette of a gecko that was on the outside of our tent. This is a gray-backed fiscal, a type of shrike. This is a yellow-throated long claw. In the morning as we would leave camp, the guides would take different roads, and if something interesting was spotted, they would communicate with each other, and then we could all meet. Here's an interesting assortment. In the back, you will see the hartebeest. There's zebra and also impala. We spotted this pair of black-backed jackals hunting. Here's a colony of red ants on the hunt. Our guides assured us that we should avoid these at all costs. Here is a crowned plover.
Here's another unusual sighting, a leopard turtle. We came upon a pride of lions. This is an older female. Look at her face and note the battle scars. She also looks like she's pretty well fed. This is a young male. He seems to be about one to two years old. Also, we notice the female stalking zebra in the area. It can often take as long as six hours for a kill. First one of these we've seen. This is a yellow billed stork. This is a small Nile crocodile on the bank. It's got its little mouth open ready for something to jump in. Here there's a larger Nile crocodile on the bank with a hippo in the river in front. Here are two female baboons taking care of a day's old baby. Okay, now this is your last chance. What is a group of baboons called? It's called a troop. Here they are, teaching the baby to eat grass. We have now been in the central, southern, and western Serengeti, and unfortunately it's now time to leave. This is the entrance to the Serengeti Airport. Here we prepare to load our 12 passenger plane. As we taxi out, our safari guides wave goodbye. It has truly been a wonderful experience. As we fly over the Serengeti, we see a herd of elephants. This is looking down at a large Maasai village encampment. Let's have a view of our two-hour flight from central Serengeti to Zanzibar, the Spice Island.
We flew over Ngoro Goro Crater. Our hotel would have been off to the right on the top of the cliff. And here we are landing on the island of Zanzibar. Here we are arriving in the Zanzibar airport. We arrive here and it's 90 degrees with very high humidity. It is hot. However, our hotel was nice and cool. Our room is on the first floor above the pool. We had a nice view. We took a walking tour of Zanzibar. This is the House of Wonders. It's a landmark building on the seafront. It was built in 1883 for the second Sultan. It was the first building to have electricity and the first in East Africa to have an elevator. The building was designed so that the Sultan could ride his elephant right up and through the building. We are in the city of Stonetown. This old fort is the oldest building in Stonetown. It was built in the 1600s to protect the city from the Portuguese. It was later used as a barracks and prison, and now an amphitheater is used for plays. This is a typical configuration for a third world telephone and electric power distribution system. The city is a maze of houses and shops. The houses are made of coral stone, which after years deteriorate and fall. You have to be careful walking these streets because the motorcycles just zip up and down. Our local guide, Mohammed, is explaining to us about the carved doors. They are mainly of Arab and Indian influence. The history of the family is explained in these carvings. The Indian style is rounded, the Arab square or rectangular. This shows three different modes of transportation. Our guide was giving us some interesting info on men. The men do the shopping, the cooking, wash the clothes, and they do the housework. It's the culture here. Men also pay a dowry to marry, and you can have up to four wives. This is our Accent on Travel group of 12, enjoying a nice al fresco dinner. A couple of us walked over to the local women's co-op. This little boat is called a dhow. It's a traditional sailing vessel with one or more masts. It has a long thin hull used for trading such things as fruit, fresh water, and merchandise along the local countries. Ah, our last sunset in Tanzania. Here we are at our final cocktail party called the Sundowner. While Gary went off snorkeling, I took off to see a spice farm. This is a shopping area along the way. Here are a few interesting notes. Children are not required to go to school. Gasoline here was $6 a gallon. And the dowel boat is made from red mahogany. Here's a family that works here at the spice farm.
the housing for the families working on the farm. The houses are made of mud. You can see the sticks and there are also some stones in the mud. As we were leaving, here are some spices that are packaged ready for sale. Finally, we come to the end. We departed our hotel in Zanzibar on the 10th of February and we arrived home on Thursday the 12th. Door to door we had 33 hours of time. The total miles that we traveled on this trip was 17,775. It was an awesome ride. It was just a fabulous, fabulous trip.